My name is Jason Andrade from the University of British Columbia, and it's my pleasure to speak to you about ablation or drug therapy for the initial treatment of atrial fibrillation. Here are my disclosures. Typically, when we've approached atrial fibrillation, we have used medication as a first-line therapy. The view was that medical therapy was relatively benign and potentially efficacious. Based on these presumptions, we would only pursue invasive procedures once patients had failed a trial of medical therapy. However, this may not be the best way forward. It may be better to consider an ablation procedure as a first treatment rather than pursue medical therapy. The reason for this is because we know that antiarrhythmic drugs are relatively ineffective at controlling atrial fibrillation. Multiple placebo-controlled trials have been performed for antiarrhythmic drug therapy, and relative to placebo, antiarrhythmic drugs are more effective with a relative benefit of approximately 50 to 80% reductions in the recurrence of atrial fibrillation. However, in absolute terms, the freedom from recurrent atrial fibrillation is less than 32%. And so effectively, less than one third of patients treated with antiarrhythmic drugs will be free of arrhythmia at one year. In addition, we know that antiarrhythmic drugs are poorly tolerated. Compared to placebo, antiarrhythmic drugs are associated with higher rates of discontinuation owing to adverse events. This is not a surprising finding, given that active drug is likely to result in more side effects compared to a placebo. More concerning, though, is the concept that these drugs may actually be associated with increases in all-cause mortality. This is data from the AFFIRM study, which was a randomized trial comparing pharmacological rate control to pharmacological rhythm control. In this study, we observed that sinus rhythm was associated with a 50% reduction in all-cause mortality. However, if an antiarrhythmic drug was required, there was a 50% increase in all-cause mortality. And so the fact that this study was neutral, we wonder if that was as a result of the therapy we were employing being harmful. We recently conducted a study where we implanted loop recorders in every patient and we tried antiarrhythmic drug therapy using standardized titration protocols. And what we observed is on follow-up that patients treated with standardized uh, titration and inclusion and exclusion criteria uh, according to best practices still experienced proarrhythmic events. On the left, you see a polymorphic wide complex dysrhythmia in a patient treated with sodalol who experienced a syncopal episode. On the right, you see a monomorphic wide complex tachycardia in a patient treated with flecainide. So then the alternative is the question about the role of catheter ablation. We know that ablation is more effective than antiarrhythmic drug therapy after drugs have failed. And so in each of these randomized trials, we see that the success of ablation is significantly higher than the success of antiarrhythmic drug therapy in a population of patients who have already failed antiarrhythmic drugs. What we didn't know until recently was whether these results would uh, hold true in a treatment-naive population, meaning a population who isn't biased towards a successful outcome. And in a randomized study we recently performed, we saw that catheter ablation, when provided as a first-line therapy, was associated with half the number of recurrences relative to antiarrhythmic drugs. In absolute terms, this was a 25% reduction in recurrence, meaning a number needed to treat of four patients to prevent a recurrence of atrial fibrillation. Importantly, this result was robust and was uh, similarly effective all the way out to three years of follow-up. And so patients treated with antiarrhythmic drugs as a first-line therapy had twice the rate of recurrence all the way through to three years of follow-up relative to antiarrhythmic or relative to catheter ablation. From a patient perspective, quality of life is important. And we know that patients with untreated atrial fibrillation, and so that's the ball, uh, bar graphs at the top, have a significant improvement in quality of life metrics when their atrial fibrillation is treated, as signified by the blue arrows pointing at the bar graphs on the bottom. 
However, importantly, in this study, which randomized patients to pharmacological rate control and pharmacological rhythm control, there was no significant difference in the quality of life metrics between these therapies. So untreated atrial fibrillation got better with drug therapy, but it did not matter what type of drug therapy was prescribed because there was no difference in the quality of life scores. In contrast, when we look at trials comparing antiarrhythmic drugs to catheter ablation, the relative benefit is in favor of ablation. And that means that while patients improve when therapy is initiated, the magnitude of improvement is significantly better with catheter ablation. And this is a clinically meaningful improvement. So this is examining the effect score. A five point difference on the effect score is associated with a clinically meaningful improvement in quality of life. And here you can see that the improvement is about 10 points with uh, ablation relative to drugs. And so ablation results in a clinically impactful improvement in quality of life relative to drug therapy. And again, this is a result that's robust. When we look out to three years of follow-up, you can see that the mean difference in effect score remains significant, meaning that that single time point intervention had a durable long-term benefit relative to daily antiarrhythmic drug therapy. And that benefit did not matter whether you were examining the disease-specific effect score or the generic quality of life score, which is EQ5D, or when you look uh, at the symptoms of atrial fibrillation. From a health system standpoint, it's important to consider the cost of our therapies. And so if we look at healthcare utilization in the form of emergency room visits, hospitalizations, or cardioversions, you can see that the year following catheter ablation is associated with a significant reduction in each of these healthcare utilizations compared to the year prior to ablation in a population of patients who have already failed antiarrhythmic drugs. It didn't matter whether you looked at the proportion of patients affected, the number of events, or the number of events per patient. In each of these evaluations, ablation was associated with a meaningful benefit. When we examine a first-line treatment population, so a population that has not been biased by prior treatment failure, these results were consistent. You can see that overall healthcare utilization was reduced about 30%, which is predominantly driven by a 60% reduction in hospitalization. Recall that hospitalization is the dominant cost associated with atrial fibrillation. So by reducing hospitalization, healthcare systems should realize significant cost savings. And so from an efficacy perspective, I think it's clear that catheter ablation is an appropriate first-line therapy and likely a preferred first-line therapy. The concern that's raised, though, is whether it is a safe intervention because we're comparing an invasive procedure to daily pharmacotherapy. And if we go back to the first line cryo balloon versus antiarrhythmic drug therapy trials, you can see that on one year of follow up, there were non significant trends to less adverse events with catheter ablation. So, at least at a year, we can conclude that they offer similar benefit and or similar risk profiles uh, in terms of adverse events. Importantly, though, when we look out beyond a year, and so now when we're at three years of follow up, you can see that there is now a significant benefit in favor of ablation. And that's because most of the risk associated with the procedure is front loaded to the time when the procedure occurs. But as time goes by, there's no additional risk that accrues. Whereas with antiarrhythmic drug therapy, every day you're taking the drug, you're potentially subjecting yourself to a risk. And therefore that risk continues to accumulate over time, putting patients at higher risk of adverse outcome. Uh, over prolonged follow-up. Another important point to consider is that the procedures that we are doing uh, have been improving over time. So percutaneous catheter ablation procedures performed uh, in the early part of the decade were associated with a higher overall rate of significant complications compared to procedures performed towards the end of the 2010s and the early 2020s. Now, that overall risk of severe complication has gone from over 3% to less than 2%, which is predominantly vascular access in etiology. The risks of tamponade are 0.6%. The risk of stroke is 0.15%. Uh, the risk of other severe complications is 0.01%. And thus, 
uh, the contemporary procedures that we perform are shifting the risk benefit balance to favor earlier intervention. So the third area to consider is potentially the impact on long-term disease. So atrial fibrillation is a chronic progressive disease. When it starts, it's an isolated electrical disorder, but over time, there's an evolution to favor abnormalities within the body of the atria uh, with these structural changes leading to more often sustained dysrhythmias due to re-entry. Uh, clinically, this manifests as short episodes of atrial fibrillation with long inter-episode intervals that gradually shorten and cluster. Eventually, the episodes become prolonged and necessitate intervention to terminate them. And in a worst case scenario, the atrial fibrillation becomes permanent. Epidemiological studies suggest that the rate of progression is in the range of 7% per year and is driven by other comorbidities such as hypertension, heart failure, uh, progressive uh, left atrial dilatation, and non-cardiac comorbidities such as diabetes, COPD, CKD, and sleep apnea. The problem is, is that we know that persistent atrial fibrillation is a higher risk entity. It's associated with a 22% higher risk of death and about a 40% higher risk of stroke, despite equal therapy being provided. And so patients with more advanced forms of atrial fibrillation represent a higher risk cohort. And thus, if we were to have an intervention that could prevent progression, we may uh, achieve significant benefits. And so the pathophysiology of atrial fibrillation is particularly complex. As mentioned, focal ectopic firing is the dominant mechanism of early atrial fibrillation with changes in the body of the atrium leading to reentry prone substrate. When we think of antiarrhythmic drugs, Effectively, they'll work on calcium handling abnormalities and ion channels, but they have minimal effect beyond direct effects on the channels themselves. A catheter ablation in performing pulmonary vein isolation will contain the focal ectopic firings. The area around the pulmonary veins is responsible for reentry, and thus that substrate is modified by a catheter ablation procedure. Moreover, the autonomic ganglia that exists just outside the pulmonary veins are often affected by our catheter ablation procedures. And so catheter ablation can be considered a multi-pronged intervention that targets the pathophysiology in multiple domains. Uh, clinically, uh, this is manifested in uh, recent studies that have looked at high burden paroxysmal atrial fibrillation patients and compared them to controls, the control patients being depicted in red on these graphs. On the top, you're looking at markers of structural abnormalities, uh, such as atrial strain and peak positive strain rate. On the bottom, you're looking at markers of atrial electrical abnormalities, such as P-wave duration. And as you can see, patients with atrial fibrillation, which are depicted in the blue lines, differ from the controls as depicted in the red lines. If a patient was treated with antiarrhythmic drug therapy in the dark blue line, you see greater divergence from controls over time, meaning worsening of the electrical and structural remodeling changes. However, patients treated with ablation in the light blue line see improvement in those parameters with gradual regression back to uh, baseline. And so mechanistically, we can see that ablation is associated with beneficial electrical and structural remodeling, whereas antiarrhythmic drugs are associated with a worsening in those parameters. Clinically, when we look at the rates of progression over time, uh, in a randomized trial, you can see that ablation is associated with about a 75% reduction in the rate of progression compared to antiarrhythmic drug therapy. And so it seems from a mechanistic standpoint, as well as from a clinical standpoint, that catheter ablation is associated with significant benefits in preventing uh, atrial fibrillation progression or disease evolution. And so we can think of it like antiarrhythmic drugs are treating the symptoms of the disease by reducing recurrences and improving quality of life. However, catheter ablation is going to the cause of the problem and minimizing the likelihood of the disease progressing. So in summary, I think we've learned that the treatment of atrial fibrillation results in improved outcomes. Ablation when provided as a first line treatment is better than antiarrhythmic drugs at preventing recurrence and preventing arrhythmia episodes. It's better than antiarrhythmic drugs for preventing progression. And either technology that we use has been shown to be relatively effective at preventing uh, disease recurrences and evolution.
And so thank you for listening.